Well, please open your Bibles up to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 this evening, and this will be our last week in this mini-series in Galatians chapter 6. If you please find it. While you're finding it, let me try to uh, bring us kind of up to speed as far as where we've been, where we're at. Had a little bit of an interruption having the rices here two uh, weeks ago and uh, taking a little bit of a break from our series. So uh, Galatians is a rather unique letter in several ways. First of all, it was expressly written to a lot of churches, a number of churches in the region about Gal around Galatia. It's a very, very personal letter from the perspective of the Apostle Paul because they actually themselves have received the gospel that he's preached to them. So they're the product of his preaching. That could be in contrast, say, to Romans, where when Paul wrote the letter to the church at Rome, he'd never been there, hadn't actually met them face to face, maybe knew some folks in the church at Rome, but he hadn't been there. But uh, Paul has to spend a good bit of time, actually, in this letter defending his apostleship. And there are a couple of, of groups of churches in the New Testament where Paul actually had to do that. One would be the church at Corinth where he really had to spend time uh, defending his right to set them right doctrinally because the accusation was, you know, you're, you aren't really even a legitimate apostle. You know, you were born out of due time. How could you have been an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ when Christ had already uh, completed the work of the cross before you became a believer? The church had already begun. So how could you be a foundational gift to the church that is an apostle, which is what... A, a foundational gift to the church is when you when you came later on and of course we know that the answer to that was by God's choice that's how in other words God met Saul on the road to Damascus and so he was indeed an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ the resurrected Savior so he was qualified in that also Saul was um, he had witnesses that he was an apostle and the witnesses were the apostles. Can you imagine being one of the original eleven and having an imposter pretend to be an apostle? And the fact is, is that Peter wouldn't have had it. Uh, James wouldn't have had it. None of the original apostles would have accepted this individual being an imposter and trying to take upon him apostolic authority. As a matter of fact, Peter, if you were to read the second, uh, the second letter of Peter, uh, Peter really affirms Paul's apostleship in his second letter, and he talks about how that people resisted the things that Paul that Paul taught because he said, you know, some of the things Paul teaches, and that's a summary, of course, he said are hard to be understood because of your attitude. He said because you rest with the Scriptures. In other words, you want to try to pin the Scriptures into your position. You want to make the Scriptures support your personal beliefs, and because of that, you have a hard time with the things that Paul says. By the way, the same is actually true today. Almost all false doctrine is supported by trying to create divisions between the, uh, the other apostles and the Apostle Paul. So sometimes you'll hear, or if you read this in a commentary, it's a good, uh, this is just a, a, a good uh, flag for you to know when it's time to tear up your commentary and set fire to it, or to stop up your ears and stop listening if somebody's preaching. When someone starts talking about Petrine theology, or Yohanan theology, that is Peter's theology, or John's theology, or Pauline theology. They are speaking of that theology as being different, differing from one another. In other words, Peter believed the gospel this way, Paul believed the gospel this way, John believed the gospel this way. My friend, I want to just tell you, if you approach the scripture that way, you'll never know what the gospel is. And that's why even today there are so many individuals that have not, as the letter to the Hebrews says, moved on, gotten beyond the basic things like the doctrines of salvation and baptisms and repentance toward, and faith toward God. That's one of the reasons that believers just are spending their time. Uh, I think they must have had Facebook back then because I think that was what they were talking about when they were talking about individuals debating and arguing and so forth. And so they spend their time just trying to establish, you know, whether or not, you know, what, what is the definition of repentance and salvation? What is, uh, what is the part of a believer's will in salvation and so forth? Friend, that's all so basic that a person who has just received Jesus as their Savior ought to have that pretty well settled. 
And so one of the things though, that those individuals are embracing that causes them to have so much division is that they actually think that the Word of God contradicts itself and that the apostles contradict one another. And Paul is really setting that straight. And actually, in, in our, our letter, and this is part of our introduction material, one of the things that Paul does mention specifically is how that he had to withstand Peter for dissemination or for separating himself from the, from the Gentiles. And, and really, when the Jews and the Gentiles in the church at Galatia were together, then Peter and the Jewish guys kind of separated themselves because of the things that they were uncomfortable about uh, in the Gentiles. And by the way, things that we could relate to, I think, as well. So the, one of the things that we need to understand is really the tone of the letter is really important because we had previously actually been in a brief study in, in uh, First and Second Thessalonians. And oh, what a contrast in the tone in which Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica because of their attitude. Remember the church at Thessalonica? Paul had been there, if you read in Acts, Paul had actually ministered there on three consecutive Sabbath days. He preached in the synagogues, and then he preached the gospel to the Gentiles, and then he'd been run out of town. And his perspective as he is actually in prison writing to the church at Thessalonica is there's no way in the world that that church could possibly be doing well because I was only there really ministering for three days. He was there during the weeks, but the Sabbaths were when he was really contending and preaching the gospel and teaching. So really he had three days of access, and yet when he pens the letter to the church at Thessalonica in the introduction, he indicates that their faith was spoken of throughout the world. Literally, that church, which had only been taught three days, had remained true to the gospel which they had received and had moved forward in their faith and were actually examples for Achaia and Macedonia in charity and in giving toward others. And, and, in, and I know this is getting to be a long-winded introduction, but it's, it's important for us to catch the tone here as we summarize Galatians. But in, in those regions, if you remember when, when Paul wrote the letter to the church at Corinth, he used, remember the churches at Achaia? In Macedonia, he used them for examples of giving to the church at Corinth. And if you'll remember, Paul had actually spent years in Corinth establishing the churches there. And we asked the practical question, is Paul the problem? Was the fact that the church at Corinth had a lot more access to his teaching and to his investment in their lives, was that the reason that the church at Thessalonica was thriving so much more? You know, just a raw, uneducated church is always just better. Is that what the Scripture is teaching? And I don't think so at all. But the fact of the matter is that it's an individual decision for people to move forward in their faith. Many's the time that uh, I've had the privilege of, of helping a person to come uh, to a saving knowledge of Christ, to know that they're born again. And many times individuals that I haven't had great expectations for have just grown because they had a heart to grow. They, they had a desire to move forward in their faith. And sometimes you just think, well, you know, I don't know what to expect from this person. I hope they understand. I hope they got it. I hope they're you know, serious about it. And then all of a sudden, man, you watch them and, and they, they literally transform their lives and they're following Jesus the rest of their lives. And that was the church at Thessalonica. They were a great example. Now, the church at Galatia, Paul, uh, Paul cut loose a couple of insults for. The first one would have been in chapter 1 and verse 6 when he said, I marvel that so soon, that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. We'll read our text in just a minute. I'm almost there. But he said, I'm amazed at how fast you've gotten off track. And he emphasized that the gospel that he preached was not a gospel that he got from this guy or that guy, but it was the gospel that was preached by Jesus Christ himself. If you're curious what that gospel is, go to John chapter 3 sometime and see what Jesus said the gospel was when he explained it to Nicodemus, and you'll know exactly the gospel that Paul preached. And that's what he was plainly indicating. The second area where Paul kind of cut loose with an insult was when he, when he began chapter 3 by saying, Oh foolish Galatians, you know, who hath bewitched you, uh, that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth. So he said, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, what, what kind of witchcraft have you gotten involved in? Who did this to you that you have swerved so radically from something that you plainly understood? which is the simplicity of the gospel. Now, what is that? What, is, what are the specifics of that? Well, in the church at Galatia, what had actually happened was that Jewish believers were teaching the gospel of circumcision. That is, they were saying, you have to, once you get saved, you need to realize that you have become a Jew. 
you have become Jewish because Jesus Christ is Jewish and now you're under the law and now you need to be circumcised and you need to practice the cleansing and you need to be a good Jewish believer in Jesus Christ. And it was, it was uh, causing a lot of confusion and a lot of the people in Galatia, boy, they were just, they were overwhelmed by it. And they were coming under this and Paul very, very plainly trounced that notion many times just like he did for the church at Rome. And he pointed out that if salvation, uh, if if uh, salvation is by faith, if we're saved by faith, uh, then we are remain saved by faith. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. And there's a phrase that is that is all the way through Galatians. If you read it carefully, and if you just were to highlight it, you would say, "By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith." And so he helped us uh, to understand the place of the law or the purpose of the law. The law he he illustrated was a schoolmaster. The law couldn't save anyone, but it was a schoolmaster to educate us on our failures, which point to our need for salvation through Jesus Christ by faith. Now here we are in chapter 6. I want to read a couple of verses and just really kind of look at a few terse, uh, short comments that Paul made that I think are very, very practical for us today. And so will you please look down uh, with me to verse 9 of chapter 6 as Paul begins to conclude a couple of things. And we really will address many of the truths all through chapter 6. But verse 9, Paul said, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. I love this because this really gives a personal note. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy. And upon the Israel of God. You don't see that anywhere in the Scripture. Anywhere else in the Scripture. And upon the Israel of God. Actual Israel those individuals who are create, completed in Christ Jesus. And so we'll pray and ask the Lord to help us with a few things that we look at this evening, and hopefully it'll be a help. Father, thank You so much. Thank You for Your Word. And I just pray that this evening, even though we've got a lot of ground to cover, that we'll be able to do it uh, clearly, simply, and ultimately have some, have some practical application that we can not only meditate on, but that will shape our thinking and our behavior. Even this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter chapter five, we, you know, Paul really gives the key to overcoming. See, see, the, the the thing that you have to give the benefit of the doubt to the Judaizers for is that they were concerned about behavior. In other words, they were concerned about Gentiles looking pagan, and uh, you know that is a concern, isn't it? Uh, the fact of the matter is that there needs to be a Christ-like identity on His followers. There needs to be, there ought to be a distinct spirit about a believer or a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you know that you have to look weird or that you have to embrace a particular uh, strange you know, Christian dress code or something like that. I'm not saying that dress is unimportant. But have you ever met somebody that really thought that there was like a dress code for Christianity? It's sort of like the homeschooler dress code. You know what I'm talking about? The uh, the jean jump skirts. Jump, yeah, jean jump skirts. Aren't that what they're called? Jean jumpers? Whatever they are. It used to have to be if you were a homeschooler and you were a lady, you had to wear a jean jumper. And um, if you were, you know, a devout Christian and you were a lady, you had to have very, very long hair and then you had to tie it into a knot and put it on the top of your head and stick a stick through it or something like that, you know, make it look like a propeller. <laughs> I'm being a little bit silly this evening, but, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, the godly look, you know, this is what you have to look like. In other words, you have to look weird 
you know, nobody else <laughs> dresses like this or looks like this, and this is how we know that we're followers of Jesus Christ. And now, that, that there isn't a Christian dress code, but there are principles, aren't there, about believers and the way we ought to look. The fact of the matter, though, is that there ought to be something about the spirit of a believer, which is distinctively Christian. I remember this happened to me one time. Somebody paid me a pretty good compliment. I was uh, assistant pastor in Delray Beach at West Park Baptist Church. I think this would have been back like in 2000. I was working on the church vans, and I was I was wearing jeans, and I was I actually, I if you ever see any of my jeans, my, my wife will tell you that I don't have like nice jeans and work jeans. Jeans are work clothing for me, and if you get me nice ones, then they will uh, very, very quickly have grease and oil stains and tears all over them. And that's just what I look like. So I had my jeans. I'm sure I had the representative oil stains. And I had, uh, I've been working on the church van. I think I was putting a transmission on a church van at the church. And I went to uh, Win Dixie for, to get something for lunch, I believe. And I was in line. And I'm wearing, you know, a t shirt, dirty jeans, and probably, you know, have a lot of grease under my fingernails. And as I'm standing in line, a lady turned around and she said to me, She said, Are you a Christian? Now, this is Delray Beach, 33% Jewish. 33% Haitian, and 33% uh, everything else from everywhere around the world. But uh, you don't really run into Christian people in Delray Beach very often. If you do, they probably go to your church. And that's about that. I mean, they're really just, it's just not an area that's known for having a lot of believers. But the lady turned around and she said, are you a Christian? And I said, well, matter of fact, I am. Are you? She said, yes, I am. I said, well, how did you know I was a Christian? She said, I don't know, I could just tell. And that was one of the best compliments I think anyone ever paid me. Because I wasn't dressed in Christian dress code. You know, I was wearing work clothes and looked kind of rough. And the lady recognized, I think, something about the spirit that I had. You know, that because, you know, when Jesus explained to Nicodemus when he talked about being born again, and he explained that the wind bloweth whither it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth, so is everyone that's born of the spirit. The Spirit of God moves in us and actually moves us. Just like you can look at a tree and you can see the wind moving the tree, the wind of the Spirit of God is moving in us, moving us, and, and uh, affects our behavior, affects our spirit. And Christian, you ought to be concerned with that. That ought to be something that you ought to strive to have for a testimony, uh, that, that Christ is in you and that you have the Spirit of Christ. And so we as believers ought to be distinct. And so I don't fault the Jewish believers for being troubled that the Gentiles looked pagan. Do you? Uh, <laughs> I wonder just how uniting you know, a barbecue, a pork barbecue would be today if, you know, or I, I should say in that day, you know, those, we're, gonna, <coughs> we're going to have a barbecue and we're going to roast a pig. I wonder how appealing that would be to the Jewish half of the church. You know, the folks that our whole life had never touched something. And you understand the abhorrence of some things, even if God has called it clean, it's just one of those things you've abhorred it your entire life and you're not going to be comfortable with it no matter what. And so I have a, I, I have a lot of sympathy, plenty of empathy, whichever one of those words you prefer and know the definition of. I have uh, plenty of understanding for people who actually you know, have feeling that believers ought to be distinctly Christ-like at the very least. But for the Jews, they had defined Christ-like as circumcision, as under the law. When they themselves had been circumcised and under the law and still needed to be saved by faith. And so what had happened is that their concern for behavior modification had overtaken their understanding of what the gospel actually was. And Christian, I want to tell you, Jesus does change us, doesn't He? God does change us. But behavior modification is not the goal. Christ-likeness is. And so that's what we need to be concerned with. And so Paul here is ending with a bit of a gentle note. I mean, he has used scathing words to describe the veering away from the simplicity of the gospel. He hasn't been kind at all to individuals in the church who have troubled believers by trying to add requirements to the simplicity of the gospel and confusing them and holding them back in their faith. He hasn't had kind words, but it does end with a kind note. Sort of like every good lecture, you know, when you correct somebody for something. you got to kind of end up with, you know, I know you're going to do the right thing. And, you know, uh, I wouldn't bother talking to you about this if I didn't think that there was, 
you know, that, that uh, you cared about what, tr what truth was and that you weren't really in your heart desirous to do the right thing. And that is sort of chapter 6. In chapter 5, Paul has explained how to have spiritual victory. In other words, the right way to behavior modification. Uh, he said, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not obey the lust of flesh. See, the problem in the church was that they weren't Spirit-filled. They were concerned with looking like good Christian Jews. But they weren't actually focusing on being filled with the Spirit. And Paul, do you remember last week when we saw that, he said, whosoever, whichever ones of you are under the law, he says, you've come under the law, he said, you've, you're fallen from grace. Whereas grace is here. This is the grace position. It's the high position. And then obviously a person cannot be saved by the law, can you? He said, if you're saved by the law, he said, you're fallen from grace. In other words, he said, you've taken, you've taken the low ground. Last week we talked about taking the high ground. Grace is always the high ground, my friend. The work of Jesus Christ is always the high ground. We talked about King of the Mountain last week, if you know what I'm talking about. That's the high ground. Now, once you get on the top of the mountain, anybody tries to come up there, you kick them. And you don't let them come up. You, you hold the high ground. And that's the grace position for us as believers. Listen, my friend, when you recognize that you're saved by grace and somebody tries to add something to it or tries to qualify it by saying, well, if you're really saved, then we'll see or then you'll do or whatever. Man, kick them. Don't let them mess with you. Don't let them take you from that position. Grace is the high ground. And Paul actually concludes that. And if you read the end of chapter 5, he repeats what he said. Hold your ground. Grace is the high ground for a believer. Don't take a lower position. And so the law, has, the law is good. The law is, uh, is, is a schoolmaster. It has its place, but it, it never could save. And it never will. And so grace is what we are all about as believers. And I'm not talking about grace which has been redefined in the last 20, 15 or 20 years as, as the doctrine of uh, the doctrines developed by that fellow John, something or other. And, you know, we're not talking about that, the doctrines of grace. What, we're talking about grace. We're talking about what the Bible teaches grace is. Not some uh, God selects individuals because of his preference to be uh, destined for heaven or destined for hell and so forth. You don't understand what I'm talking about there. And so, walk in the Spirit and you should not obey the lusts of flesh. Behavior modification needs to be a result of Spirit filled living. You walk in the Spirit, my friend, your countenance will be different. You walk in the Spirit, your responses will be different. You walk in the Spirit, I promise you, your behavior will not have problems. You won't have to solve, you won't even have to figure out everything to do because you'll be Spirit-led. You'll be walking in the Spirit. Now, uh, Paul has some kind things to say and some helpful things to say. Verse 1 of chapter 6, I'd like just, just to, uh, if, if you don't mind, just kind of do a running, running commentary as we go through. He begins, first of all, by saying, Brethren, if any of you be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And then he gives two opposite perspectives on the responsibilities and duties of a believer. First of all, the purpose of trying to help someone who isn't living right is restoration. And the means to restore a person is not by giving them rules or laws. The means to restore them is by you yourself being spiritual. Being spiritual. You know what spiritual is? It isn't pious. Being spiritual means spirit-filled. That is feeding the spirit to the point that you're spirit-led. And if if you're spiritual, you'll be able to respond to that person, not by saying you need to do this and this and this and this, but by actually restoring a person to that, to that spiritual uh, position. Or if you think about it from the, from the illustration that, that we saw in chapter 5, to the high ground of grace. Okay, then Paul says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We know what Christ's law was, don't we? What was, what was Jesus' law? We don't know, do we? Do we? What's the law of Christ? Ten Commandments. Oh, no. We already had the Ten Commandments. Remember, remember I, 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 was it a rabbi that summarized the law pretty well? He said, on all these hang the law and the prophets. Okay, so I see what we need, where we need to go next. <laughs> Love one another. Huh? And so fulfill 
the law of Christ, right? Uh, hereby know we that we love God. How do we know that we love God? Yeah, we keep His commandments. We love one another. All right, what's the law of Christ? It's to love one another. So the Bible says, bear you one another's burdens. There is a great difference between placing a burden on, burden on someone and bearing someone's burden. Do you see the difference? See, this is not a, a statement divorced from any kind of context here. Paul has, said, has just said, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one with the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. How does a person restore a person in the spirit of meekness in a spiritual way? By assessing a burden or a load? Hey, listen, you think, you think it's tough living for Jesus. Here's something else you need to do. <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? Yeah, I, I, I do think some Christians feel like they are God's appointed uh, messengers to let people know not only their shortcomings and failures, but just you know things that you, you have to do to be a real Christian. When I was growing up, they were the they were the uh, cigarette haircut guys, you know. You know, now that you're saved, you know you can't really be saved and smoke. You know, they were those guys who, are, you know, it's a shame for a man to have long hair, don't you know? And so, if you're really serious about this Christian thing, we need to whack that ponytail right now, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> when I was growing up, that was it, man. That was, yeah, you know, it's Shamir. Wow. Well, you guys grab a hold of him. Don't let him out of the service. <laughs> <laughs> What's we'll that on Pastor Price's barber shop? <laughs> no, seriously, you know, there are a lot of folks that, you know, it's like, here's a burden for you. And here's something else. You know, folks are struggling with whatever it is, and then you just levy that. And the Bible says, don't put burdens on people, carry burdens for them. There's a big difference, isn't there? Listen, this is what you need to do, and this is how I'm going to help you do it. You know, it's pretty practical, actually, to know whether or not you fulfilled the law of Christ by asking yourself this week, how many people's burdens have I borne? Do you think that in a, in a small group like we have here this evening, do you think there might be some burdens in this place? Might there be individuals here tonight that are, that are struggling under a load? And that load is crushing them, defeating them, and actually causing them to fall from grace. By fall from grace, I don't mean it like John means. I'm talking about, you know, take the lower position. Bear you one another's burdens. So be a problem solver. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. I can help you. And be an enabler as a Christian. But then the Bible also has an almost opposite statement two verses down. Uh, in, in verse... Five, the Bible says, Every man shall bear his own burden. For every man shall bear his own burden. Look at verse 4. But I let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So here we find that in spite of the fact that we're told as believers that we are to bear one another's burdens, that we also bear individual responsibility. And I'm going to tell you something. Blame, blame, blame. Anthony and I, we have this conversation almost every day, don't we, Anthony? Anthony blames me for something almost every day. Like, you know, um, can I share this? Do you mind if I use you for a bad example, Anthony? It would be fun if we do this? Okay. You, you going to hate me afterward? Okay. Or we'll go ahead and, let's go ahead with this. Okay. We can't decide. Okay. So, yesterday I gave Anthony less time to do his homework than he normally gets. And the reason for it is I've realized he hasn't been very efficient. Like he, he's very, very diligent at going to work at night. Matter of fact, Anthony has an amazing amount of uh, patience because he can sit down to do his homework at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and still be sitting in the same place staring at the same book at 10 o'clock at night, except he hasn't turned a page or read anything <laughs> in it. You know, so it's just not very... We're working on efficiency, you know. So I told him yesterday, you know, you're not going to have much time. We're going to do some things around the house and we're going to go on visitation. You're not going to have much time to do homework. And so he, st he said, well, you know, and whatever, you know, I got a lot of homework to do. And I said, I know you do, but you're not very efficient in it. And I noticed yesterday that 
you didn't get anything done in like five hours and so you know I'm, we're going to cut back the amount of time and try to be more efficient and not waste as much time doing homework because you're not getting homework anyway, what's the point of spending five hours so he started blaming me he said well the reason i didn't get anything done yesterday was because you made me eat hamburgers and then you made me do the dishes you know, it doesn't take five hours to eat hamburgers and wash the dishes. But that's the blame game. That's how it goes. And then I realized today when I was doing the dishes that he actually had just kind of like stood in front of the sink going like this, but he hadn't even done the dishes. <laughs> I found the dishes. So, <laughs> okay, Anthony's a great guy. He'll never do that again, so don't think badly of him for that. But he blames me for everything. I mean, it's just like, well, you know, it's your fault I didn't get this done. So we've been, we've been addressing that. You know that that uh, that's actually society. I mean, I blame everybody for everything, too. I can tell you why everything, every project in my house is not done. I can give you a good reason for it. I can tell you why everything in the church isn't done. I can even tell you who's to blame for it that besides me. You know, we, we're blamers, aren't we? And the, the, but the Galatians, so Anthony, you're just like us, except you're, you're, you're at an advanced level. We're going to scale back. So, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we're very, very good at shifting responsibility. And that's what blame is. Blame is saying, not my responsibility, this person's responsibility, and we won't go back to the garden and play that silly game. So what we see in Galatians is Paul is simply saying, you need to bear one another's burdens, but you also need to realize that your failure is your failure. Every man's going to bear his own burden. So maybe someone didn't help you, but it was your burden that they didn't help you with. In other words, it was your responsibility. You should have been responsible for it. You know, so here's, here is just a, a, another one of these snapshots of what grace looks like. Grace is, this is your burden, but being part of the body means that there are people that will help to bear the burden, help to carry the load. And so maybe you're responsible for it, but I'm going to help you with it. You'll answer for whether it's done or not, so it better be done. I'll uh, help you. And Paul mentions that, and then he goes on to say, let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That's an interesting verse. You ever, you ever uh, read verse uh, 6 carefully and try to understand it? Let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. The idea of taught is a different word than mostly what we usually use for teaching. Usually we use the word didasco. This word has... Uh, didasco is more like a, of a word that's... A, that is in the nominative, but it can also be used in, in a verb form. And it carries with it the idea of didactic or material being taught. This word, teaching, is more of a uh, direction, more of a looking to. It's, it's sort of a discipleship kind of a word. In other words, it's kind of a pointing toward. So let him that is taught in the word. Okay, so you're pointing this person. You know, in other words, it's a, it's a guidance kind of a word. It's less about knowledge and material as it is about, about the direction, the pointing or looking toward. And in context, it's always looking toward the teacher, actually. And so the Scripture says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And so what it's saying simply is, the person who's being taught needs to respond to the teacher. Needs to look to the teacher, if you will, and to communicate the things that are taught. And to, to have a good response. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. Another verse which, which indicates individual responsibility. How is it that a person can have victory over the flesh? Walk in the Spirit, right? Walk in the Spirit. How do you walk in the Spirit? Well, you feed the Spirit. So make the Spirit stronger. And the Scripture just plainly indicates again that if you sow to the Spirit, you'll have the Spirit. You're going to spirit, uh, the Spirit reap life everlasting. In other words, what you invest in is what you'll reap from. And the Bible says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Is anyone here as bored by monotonous, routine, piecework kind of task as much as I am? 
How many of you like to do this? Just like the same, like assembly line kind of a task. You know, same motion, same motion, same. Not me. Man, I like to, I like to have interactive tasks where I'm out and about, and it's always changing. And I like problem solving. Um, and uh, you know, it just, I, I, I don't like to be locked into a place doing something. You ever laid tile? You ever laid tile? You know, in a, in a room. You got to square the room. Once you square the room, you find the center of it. That's the proper way to do it. You start from the center, and you, you mix your thin set. You set your piece perfectly. And you make sure that it's perfectly level. And you, some guys can do it with the eye. Some guys have to have a level, you know, to do it right. But you get a little practice, and some guys have to use spacers. Some guys can do it without spacers. But every single piece has to be placed, squared, leveled, placed, squared, leveled. And the smaller the tiles, the longer it takes to do a room. And I don't know about you, but when you start and you lay that first piece and you realize, well, it just took me 15 minutes to get that first piece right. <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is going to be a while. And then you lay the second piece. And you know, when you stick with it, though, pretty soon you look around and you look at maybe you've started from a, you know, you've worked your way into a corner and now you're working out it. And you look at the part of the room that you've done, you're like, well, that's looking pretty good over there. It's looking pretty nice. And then you realize, well, you know what? The pieces are going in faster. I'm getting a routine. I'm getting more efficient, more effective at it. And after a while, you realize I can also think about other things or do other things, hopefully not too much. And actually, I, this, now that I'm just in the routine, it doesn't bother me as much. And it, it's really kind of, uh, kind of a, a reference that complements what Charlie's been teaching in Sunday school. It's just faithfulness. Just, just say, okay, maybe it's not glamorous. Maybe it's not exciting. Maybe every single thing I do doesn't have a pop and a flash and fireworks with it. But I'm building something. I'm accomplishing something. And you know, it doesn't take very long before the time passes. Maybe it's an eight-hour job, and now I'm in the sixth hour, and I'm realizing, okay, you know what, I can do this. You know, a lot of Christians, because of monotony or because of boredom, they walk away from the task of just faithfully serving the Lord Jesus. And instead of sowing to the Spirit, instead of saying, you know what, it is work to get in the Word of God and to make sure that, you know, that I actually know what the words mean, that I under understand the context, and that I faithfully do it. You know, but it's kind of neat when you get to the end of the year, if you're trying to do through the Bible in a year maybe, and you've stuck with it and you haven't quit, and you realize, I I've almost read the whole Bible. And you reflect back and you recognize, you know something, I've come, I've, I've traveled some ground. I've accomplished some things and God's done a work in me. It's something when you commit to a, maybe a church ministry and you realize when you commit to it, it's really, really scary because you, know, you can't just jump in and out of it. You've got to always be there. And you realize, okay, so that I'm never going to have a Saturday ever again for the rest of my life. Amen. Yeah, that's the way I feel. I'm never going to have a Saturday ever again for the rest of my life. And then you realize, well, you know what? I, that's all right. Because, and by the way, I'm not saying a Christian is faithful never has a Saturday again for the rest of their life. But, you know, being faithful to something does kind of lock you into a commitment. And you realize, you know what? I've been doing this for two years, and I, don't, I can't remember missing anything important. But I do realize that I've invested in something that's eternal. And the Bible says in due season we show... Uh, we reap if we faint not, and we're sowing of the Spirit. The Bible says to into life everlasting. So you're investing in this life for eternal life. And Paul's trying to give a practical, this is not behavior modification, but he's trying to talk about the practical reason for a believer to do the very same things that the Judaizers would like to see for behavior modification, but for a completely different reason and from a completely different perspective. The one perspective being, it's a burden, it's a load, and it's more than you can bear. The other perspective being, it's freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from the flesh, and I can do this. And I can help others, and others can help me. And it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's such a different approach to a similar problem. Hey, you, you ever think that maybe I've looked at our church and thought, you know something, we don't look... We don't really look like believers. You know, I'm not talking about dress. I'm just talking about commitment level. I'm talking about love for the Lord. I'm saying, man, we've got a long ways to go. We don't need, you know, we don't need the barber shop to fix that problem. We don't need the tailor to fix that problem. 
We need to be spirit-filled. And that'll fix the problem. And so, Paul is internalizing what the Judaizers have externalized. And that's the key. Let's finish. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This cost me $200 the other day. I was thinking about this verse. I just read it. And somebody came and asked me for $200. And I had $200. When does that ever happen? Seriously. I had $200, two $100 bills. And the guy came and said, I need $200. And I just read Galatians 6.10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially in the more of the household of faith. So guess who doesn't have $200 anymore? <laughs> Anybody here got $200 you can give me? <laughs> no, seriously, if you can, if you can, do good and all men. See, that's that's the idea. Listen, folks, it's, it's, it's from the heart. It's, it's, a, it's a mindset that says, you know, if there's opportunity to do good, do it. Why? Well, we've just seen life everlasting mentioned. That's our motivation. And then Paul personalizes to the church at Galatia, whom he has uh, taken the liberty of being rather scathing to. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Do you see this? They want you to make them look good. They want to be able to say, hey, look how Jewish we've made these Gentiles look. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. What is a constraint? Well, that's a fetter. That's a bondage. That's something that ties you down. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And Paul exposes their motives. Their motive is that the unsaved Jews are going to say that they're not very Jewish. And that they're rubbing shoulders with uncircumcised people. And for the sake of people that don't love God and haven't trusted, haven't received Christ by faith, they want to affect their brethren so that they'll be approved by people who don't love them. I can't remember the exact quote, but I love what Samuel Clemens said once about how much effort we invest into impressing people that we actually don't even like. And oftentimes for the church we do this. Let me use an illustration. No, let me don't use an illustration. I don't have time. Uh, let me just try to state it as simply as I can. Often in the church, we try to get our brothers and sisters to look impressive to people that aren't part of the family. Let me just tell you something about family. Did you know that your, you know this, because it's true in your family especially, because I've observed it. Your family members are quirky. The people... You, you know, they're quirky, they're strange, they're odd. I'm not talking about my family members, I'm talking about yours. Yeah. Your, you, you, the people you're related to are weird. You know, they are, they're just, they're odd. And um, it's easy to pick on them because of it. And as a matter of fact, they're embarrassing. It's embarrassing being around your family members, if you think about it. This is the way my dad, my dad used to just absolutely humiliate. My dad's one of those guys that knows what not normal is and, just tries really hard just to embarrass you. When I was a teenager, I just remember being humiliated. My friends thought my dad was so cool, and I did not think he was cool. Because he just said, humiliate me. And if you knew my dad, you know what I'm talking about. You know, And I'm not just saying that because I was because I try to be cool. That's really the truth. But you know, when you really love somebody, you realize, yeah, they're weird and it's endearing. Isn't it? When you actually love somebody, the things that are quirky or strange or odd about them, bring a smile to your face and a warmth to your heart. Don't they? I mean, you just think about this. That, why, why does he do that? <laughs> yeah, that thing. You know what I'm talking about? You can just fill in the blank. Why does he do that? And then when you love him, you're like, I don't know, but it's funny. I like it. You know, whatever. I don't care what anybody thinks about it. And the problem is, that oftentimes in the church we actually love the world more than we love the brethren. And so we're actually embarrassed by the brethren and willing to be ashamed of them 
So oftentimes we want to try to make them look in a way that the world accepts or approves. That's one of the reasons I think that the church is so worldly. And it doesn't need to be so. We don't need to modify people's behavior around us so that we can convince our worldly friends that we're just the same as they are. It's not that the odd, quirky, weird things, you know, are what are are what uh, make us spiritual. That isn't what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that making someone look the way the world looks, so that the world will look at you and say, "Well, you're not much different than me," takes away our identity, which is that we're like Jesus. And Paul said in verse 13, "Neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law." <laughs> he said, "They don't keep the law. They're trying to get you to keep." Uh, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. And then he went on to say, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He says, you know what, the world just doesn't have that. It's, they're trying to make you, they're trying to make you be approved by the world. And actually, God forbid that I do that to you because I, the, as far as I'm concerned, the world's dead. I'm crucified to the world. I'm dead to the world. And what the world thinks doesn't matter about me. And, and friend, you ought to just love the brethren, regardless of what anyone outside thinks about them. And you know, they're quirky. Sometimes when guests come to our church, they ask me about the strange person. You know, if you're wondering who it is, it's you. They ask me about. Wait, that wasn't nice, was it? That doesn't fit with 2018. My apologies. Please forgive me. They say, you know, tell me about that. Tell me about that person. You know, and they're asking, you know, I'll tell them, I man, they're fantastic. I love them. That's what you have to say about people that are your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. They're family. Family by choice. I joined this family because I wanted to. I became a member of this local body. It was my choice. This is my family. And you did too. So rather than put burdens on one another and try to make our local family be approved by people who aren't family. We just need to love one another and fulfill the law of Christ. Bear each other's burdens. It's amazing, isn't it, how some complex spiritual problems and some major doctrinal issues, which have names in the Latin, are just boiled down to simple attitudes that we can respond to. Incorrect. And as a result, God will be pleased. So I hope it's practical for you. I hope you understand that the way you're saved is the way that you walk by faith, by grace. And that you'll see the necessity and importance of loving one another, of bearing one another's burdens, keeping in mind the entire time that you and I are answerable, answerable to God for our own lives. And that we will ultimately have to bear our own burdens. We won't be able to blame shift or say the reason is because this person or that person. And that's where the rubber really meets the road and becomes very, very practical. My friend, we're going to live somewhere forever. If you're a child of God, that place is, is with God. You have eternal life. And we need to be focused on eternal, eternal matters, eternal life, rather than temporary or temporal life. And if we do that, one day at a time, one act at a time. Life will soon pass us by. And you'll be able to look back and you'll be able to look at what was accomplished and what was, what was done. And you'll be able to stand before God and He'll simply say to people that really don't know everything and know how to do everything, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that ought to be our, what we're striving for and what our goal is, not to please people that don't love the Lord. Father, thank you for what we've learned. In the last several weeks, I ask that you'll help us to practically apply it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's three weeks in a row I've gone pretty long, and so maybe it'll always be that way from now on. I don't know if I should apologize or just threaten. Not really. Uh, let's take. Deal with it. Yeah. Let's uh, let's take some prayer requests tonight, shall we?